From the Christian Research Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina, you're listening to the best of the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff. We're on the air because life and truth matter. The mission of the Christian Research Institute is to equip believers to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. For more information, resources, or to donate to CRI, call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. That's equip.org. And now, here's Bible Answer Man host, Hank Hanegraaff. And thank you very much, Randy. It is a, uh, a great privilege, as always, to be in studio as we answer your questions throughout the United States, Canada, and questions now coming in from around the world as we've gotten more and more engaged in digital media platforms. The reach of the Christian Research Institute continues to extend, and we praise God for that. Uh, the more I am involved in ministry, the more I am committed to making every single moment count. Life is but a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Only one life, soon twill be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Remember all the resources we talk about on the broadcast, you can find at equip.org. You can also talk to our resource consultants. They're always available to you. The number to dial to talk to our resource consultants, 888 and letter C-R-I. Or you can, as always, write me at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. And again, don't remember, don't, for, don't forget the, uh, don't remember, don't forget equip.org. You can find all of our resources there. It is the uh, preferred destination if you want to find resources that have been carefully vetted. I'm going to start the broadcast today a little differently by going right to our callers. First up is Amanda. She's listening in Covington, Georgia. Hi, Amanda. Hey, Hank. Um, I've been listening to your show for about a year now. I just want to thank you for your for your ministry. Um, we, um, I live in a small uh, rural community in Georgia, about 50 miles outside of Atlanta. And, um, you know, we've always been really small. And um, we have a, a group of Muslims uh, that have bought property right across the street from where we live. And um, they are building a mosque. And they're also planning on building a community around the mosque. It's a huge piece of property. Um, we have tried to fight it. Um, we were on um, the news briefly about it. Uh, basically, we were getting called racist and, um, you know, getting, you know, really a hard time about it um, for trying to fight it. Uh, the freedom of religion came up and everything. And the, the, the way they went about buying their land uh, was very manipulative. Um, from my understanding, they lied about what they were building. They said they were building a community center. Um, they, it, and kind of sold it as that to the family that owned the property that they bought it from. Um, so anyway, I just don't know. We've been praying a lot. We have a, a lot of churches praying about this. Um, they kind of left it alone for a while, but now they're actually in the process of building. They have, um, you know, bulldozers that are coming out and then um, the building's beginning. They've been out there kind of daily looking at the property, um, see where I guess where the, what they're doing. But anyway, we we have a group called the Song Alliance that has been trying to help us legally with this, but I, I don't know if there's much more we can do um, besides just pray. I keep praying. Um, but just your, can, just your thoughts on that, um, you know, and how to go about from here on out with this. Yeah, well, a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, first of all, the uh, the pandemic problem is that you have enormously wealthy uh, Saudi businessmen who are Wahhabs. The uh, they're, they're, they're that particular strain of uh, 
Sunni Islam, which is the largest strain within Islam. The Sunnis are by far uh, larger than Shia, for example, and, and, and the Shia than the Sufis. But the idea here is that they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars building madrasas and mosques all over the world, including the Western world. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind as I think about this is uh, why is it that they're willing to do for a lie what Christians oftentimes are not willing to do for the truth? Uh, Christians have so many billions and billions of dollars that could be invested for the kingdom of Christ. And oftentimes we're living for the city of man as opposed to living ultimately for the city of God. So I'm simply affirming the fact that this is going to be an issue that people are going to have to deal with more and more as time goes on because uh, the Saudis, and, and, and this is not a, exclusive to the Saudis, but I, I think we can point to the Saudis because of all the oil money and the fact that they're an ally of the United States, are intent on doing the very thing that you are now experiencing in your community. Now, uh, I I think this is uh, an interesting question that you raise. What what do you do about it? Well, uh, first of all, this is why I wrote the book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. I wrote that book uh, so that people would understand what Islam really is. Uh, so that people would have an understanding of the difference between Islam and Christianity. But this is not just an academic exercise. It is so that we can use the distinctions as springboards or opportunities to share the truth and the life that only Jesus Christ can bring to the human heart. And that is whether the human heart is now a Muslim heart or a Hindu heart or a Buddhist heart or an atheist heart. So I think that prayer is firing the winning shot. However, uh, we must be involved in the process of being equipped, being prepared, always ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us with gentleness and with respect. Because as the heart changes, everything else changes as well. So now you have a mission field on your own doorstep. And the question is, what are you going to do about that mission field? Do you really believe in the power of the gospel to transform? Well, if you do, here's an opportunity to put the gospel to the test, as it were, to see that the gospel is just as transformative today as it was in the first century. So think about that contrast. Right now we're living in an epoch of time in which there's soft persecution against Christians. But the first century church lived at a time where there was hard persecution against Christians. In other words, if you were a Christian, oftentimes you were dragged off to the hippodromes and killed. Or oftentimes uh, all your social standing was taken away from you. And yet the power of the gospel prevailed no matter how dark the times. And I think this is really what needs to happen in our epoch of time. Christians need not to think of themselves as victims of a culture, but as victors through Christ and the power of the resurrection. And so I think, well, on the one hand, it is unfortunate that we have migration without assimilation, I've called it the python swallowing its prey with a long and slow digestion, although that's not original with me. Um, I'm looking at the fact that Christians are being marginalized. I'm looking at the demographic problem, which is to say polygamous Muslims are rushing in to fill the vacuum that has been created by our abortion and our euthanasia and our... 
uh, transgenderism and sexual, sexual fluidity, all these things contribute to a demographic demise um, of Western culture and polygamous Muslims are filling the vacuum that has been created. But again, the only thing that you can do is to wield the power not of the sword but of the word and that is transformative not only for those who are touched but for you yourself uh, a, a, as a Christian. So I, here, here, here's the thing I'm saying in all of that. Let's not just curse the darkness. I mean, we have to be aware of it. But we need to build a lighthouse in the midst of the gathering storm. And I was doing a podcast with Mindy Bells, who uh, wrote a terrific book uh, titled They Say We Are Infidels, and uh, talking about that very thing in, in, in Western civilization, how you change hearts one heart at a time. Uh, I, I had a Muslim that lived with us, and, I mean, it took a tremendous amount of work, not just to see a conversion, but to disciple a Muslim uh, or a former Muslim. It takes work, it takes effort, but it's transformative for the person that's involved in it. And so, uh, uh, again, if we have an eternal perspective, I mean, I would see this as a great opportunity. I mean, this does not mean that we want to be Pollyannish about anything. I mean, I think we have to look realistically at the problems we're facing in Western civilization. But as Christians, we know that the fault line of sin runs to the middle of the human heart, and the only solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Muslims ultimately are empty because they have not filled the vacuum that only the triune God can fill. Yeah, and I think um, with that's the, con- the conclusion that we tried to come to as church com- as the church community um, uh, here in the town. Uh, we we are looking at it in that light as a mission field now. Uh, we, the, you know, everything that we tried, you know, to try to stop. We we were just concerned about the Shira law. Well, you um, should be. I mean, this the, is a th- they were trying to enforce those things and everything, but. Um, we're really trying, as, as, as the church, we're trying to, to look at it in that light. Yeah, and, and I think that's why. These are human beings that, with a soul um, that that God created and, and, and that Jesus loves. And so um, that's how we're trying to see it now. And well, that's great. And, and, and you know, what you're communicating is, is, is very wise. I mean, I, I've actually written about the fact that if you want to gain a perspective on what creeping Sharia is like in the modern world, you have to look no further than Brunei. This is in South uh, East Asia. In, in 2014, so this is fairly recent history, the Sultan of Brunei announced his plan to impose Sharia. And he did it in three phases. Uh, the first phase included fines and prison sentences for crimes such as pregnancies outside of wedlock, uh, for propagating religions other than Islam, for not attending mandatory Friday prayers. The second phase included floggings, the cutting off of hands for property offenses, and the third phase included stonings. And these stonings were for offenses like uh, adultery, abortion, sodomy, blasphemy. And all of this, according to the Sultan, was to cohere to Allah's command as written in the Quran. Now, what Brunei is imposing on its citizens is standard fare in Muslim countries. And I would say, to your point... It is now standard form in Muslim enclaves in Western democracies where Sharia has become the law within the law. And no demographic has been more adversely affected than women. And so... Again, that's why I'm saying we should not be Pollyannish about this. This is a major problem. Uh, But we can at once make ourselves 
conversant with what the issues are. And again, that's why I wrote Muslim, what you need to know about the world's fastest growing religion. I saw the problem. I wanted to write something that people could wrap their arms around. It is a problem. But the fact that it is a problem should not negate our understanding of the power of the gospel to make a difference in these dark times. Again, as the heart changes, everything else changes, even behavior. Uh, Sharia estate state is Sharia. But when the heart changes and someone becomes Christian, then they start realizing that the prescriptions of Christ are very different than that of Muhammad. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. So Jesus believed in separation of church and state, unlike uh, Sharia law. A lot more could be said. Again, the information is best I could codify in a memorable ma- uh, manner in Muslim, what you need to know about the world's fastest growing religion, available for those who support the ministry of the Christian Research Institute all this month. Check it out on the web at equip.org. We'll be right back with more. So please don't touch that dial. For most Americans, pronouncements from our public officials that Islam is a religion of peace are impossible to reconcile with daily headlines and jarring photos of global Islamic jihadist atrocities. To help you understand the real Islam, Hank Hanegraaff would like to send you his new book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. Simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift in support of the Bible Answer Man broadcast and other life-changing outreaches of the Christian Research Institute. Call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Stay with us. Hank Hanegraaff will be back with more right after this. Are you the product of millions of years of unguided, purposeless, natural processes? Or are you created in the image of a loving God? Faced with the overwhelming scorn of evolutionary proselytizers, it can be hard to articulate the truth about God's creative work. And even among faithful Christians, many misconceptions linger. The Creation Answer Book by Hank Hanegraaff puts answers to the most hotly debated origins questions right at your fingertips, giving you clarity and understanding. Learn to articulate the truth about our origins clearly and compassionately when you request your copy of the Creation Answer Book or listen to Hank's insightful answers with the unabridged audiobook version on CD. Receive your copy of the Creation Answer Book or the audiobook on CD from the Christian Research Institute when you call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. The history of Islam is one of wanton carnage and horrific oppression, and it has been whitewashed beyond recognition by our politically correct elites. According to credible sources, 120 million Africans, 80 million Hindus, 60 million Christians, 10 million Buddhists have been slaughtered in the name of Islam. And that doesn't include the millions of Muslims killed by other Muslims. Islam is the only significant religious system in the history of the human race with a socio-political structure of laws that mandate violence against the infidel. Read Hank Hanegraaff's stunning book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. Receive your copy as our appreciation for your financial partnership when you call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. 
In Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs of the Bible's Divine Inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org, equip. Org. Grave is the specter of global Islamic jihadism now exacting mass genocide on Christians in the East and ever multiplying terrorist attacks throughout the West. Worse still, Western governments, academic institutions, and media outlets seem bent on exporting a false narrative respecting the religious animus animating global Islamic jihadism. In Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion, Hank Hanegraaff not only outlines the problems in accessible and memorable fashion, but moves toward potential solutions in the clash of civilizations. Receive your copy of Muslim as our appreciation for your financial partnership. Simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. Let's return to your host, Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you much, Randy. And we will now go to your calls. First up is Al listening in Washington, D.C. Hi, Al. How you doing, Mr. Hanegraaff? God bless you and your family, and um, again, praying for your health. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Did you Have you ever heard of a guy called Ray Haggins or Hagins? Yes, we have, we, we, we have heard of him. So I'm, um, I'm a black man. I, don't, I obviously don't want to follow a belief just because it has a certain, uh, you know, race tied to it. And, and, and I'm a, I mean, I'm a full-blooded Christian. I believe in Christianity completely. But I just wanted to know if you had any information about him. He's talking a lot about there's no real Jesus Christ and, and there's no real religion and none of the characters are true. Just want to know if you know anything about him. Well, yeah, a couple things. Let me say this, Al. I mean, first of all, um, w- when you think about race, I think it's really important to remember Galatians chapter 3, where Jesus is said to be the royal seed of Abraham. And then we're told at the end of the chapter that if we are in Abraham's royal seed, uh, then we are an heir according to the promise. It has nothing to do with your gender. It has nothing to do with your race or ethnicity. It has nothing to do with your station in life. If you are in Christ, you are true Israel. Uh, so the, this idea is, is, is first and foremost in the mind of every Christian, and therefore we don't see each other as, uh, a, a, as people that are inferior or superior. We don't believe in race in that sense. We only believe in race in the sense of running the race. And we look at every single human being uh, as, as made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, the very notion of looking down on another human being because of their ethnicity or their genealogy, is abhorrent to a true Christian ethic. But I think uh, you pointed something out very wisely in the prologue to the question, Ray, and that is, you know, this Ray Hagen's starts, I should say Al, sorry, um, this Ray Hagen starts with a presupposition, as you noted, that Jesus never existed. And, and there's no warrant for that whatsoever, Uh, not only in the spiritual mind, but in the secular mind. There's no doubt that Jesus Christ did exist, and you don't have to rely solely on biblical references. Uh, You can look at extra-biblical references which underscore the reality that Jesus Christ existed. I mean, you look at the greatest uh, historians of the Roman Empire, they all take the existence of Christ for granted. 
so this idea that Ray Higgins has that uh, Jesus didn't exist and that Christianity is based on you know, Egyptian religions that becomes the prototype for uh, Christianity, all of that is simply false, and it is patently and demonstrably false. So uh, he has no leg to stand on from the standpoint of history, from the standpoint of Scripture, and certainly from the standpoint um, of of uh, his, his contention that Christianity borrowed from ancient pagan religions. Well, that that's what that that's what kind of scares me. Well, here's what kind of scares me is that um, just like other religions that base themselves on um, on uh, different races. You know, when I when I listen to him, you if you don't know, if you don't read, if you don't study, you know the stuff that he says can be pretty convincing. But that's what it is. If you don't if you don't study, I mean, he says a lot about you know how the Council of Nicaea and and, and uh, he mentioned three other councils, how they got together and they put the Bible together and they decided what was true and what wasn't true. And he named all these councils and all these different years. And it's, it's pretty scary to hear it because he is really gaining some steam. I don't know how long he's been around, but he is really gaining some steam. We should probably put a fact sheet out. I don't know if we have in our research department. Probably be a good idea. But yeah, there's so much misinformation about what happened at the Council of Nicaea. Yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of people say that in Singular, uh, that is a singularity. There were two councils in Nicaea, actually. Uh, but, but, but I think it's important for us to get a little better fix on what happened in the seven ecumenical councils. Oftentimes people refer to them, but they do in sort of a conspiratorial way. So perhaps we can uh, add that to our to-do list uh, and, and make that that information available as well. I, I think there's a problem, and I think you underscore it, uh, Al, and that is we don't only have biblical illiteracy uh, afoot in the land, but we also have historical illiteracy, and therefore people uh, like this Ray Hagans can get away with uh, giving a distortion of the facts, and uh, you know, again, people fall for the skin of the truth stuff with a great big lie. Right. Well, Hanga, thank you so much. If there's any resource you can uh, point me to um, just to help, you know, because I'm getting questions from people about these things and Facebook and different things. So uh, if there's any resource you can point me to that I can uh, kind of pull out and uh, that will help with, with this issue. Sure. Uh, a, a couple of things. One is this idea that Christianity borrowed from ancient pagan religions. I, I did an entry in the Complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition on this. We also did an article in the Christian Research Journal on this, which should be up on the web at equip.org. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, having a fact sheet on, on Rehagans, I don't, I don't think we've done that. I have to check with our research department, but if we haven't, uh, let, let, let me look into doing that. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And uh, again, God bless you and, 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 and your health. Yeah. Oh, one other thing, and someone just reminded me of this in studio. Um, we did an article in the Christian Research Journal. Uh, it, it was titled, The Origin and the Insufficiency of the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. That might be uh, somewhat relevant to your point as well. Okay, well that would be great. Well, if it's up on the web, I'll I'll go get it. Well, I know we. I don't know if it's up on the. It, it is up on the web. Okay, I, I'm. We, we're, I get these hand signals. Someone just put their their, their thumb up. It is on the web. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Hank. And uh, again, God bless you and get well. Bless you, my brother. Thank you for calling. You know, I, I wanted to take a uh, a Facebook question. Th- this one is a a very significant question. Yeah, and I don't want to forget it today, so let me deal with it right now. It comes from Chuck. And it's very, very tender. He talks about his wife and uh, I deciding to be surrogate parents for my sister and her husband. We're planning on using my brother-in-law's sperm and my wife's egg. And my wife plans on carrying the child. My wife and feel, and I feel that it's a great blessing that we have to she has to do this for them, but we, we brought it up with our church, and they seem to frown on it. 
we prayed on it, and we feel we're doing the right thing, but it's starting to make us wonder what God feels because our church doesn't like it. Did I miss something in the Bible? Now that's a a well-worded question, and I want to give a response to that question for Chuck and everybody else listening in. Um, First of all, I think it's a great example that Chuck checked with the church before going further, and I think that's exactly the right thing to do. Uh, Get advice within the context of a healthy, uh, well-balanced church. Uh, But the second point I would make, and this is uh, perhaps the Sillian point, is that the introduction of third parties through uh, through sperm or egg donation, or, or, or through the surrogate motherhood, is inconsistent with the biblical pattern of continuity between procreation and parenthood. And the one flesh marital relationship becomes convoluted through this process. And this is so even through the particular form of surrogacy uh, that is being talked about by Chuck and his wife. I mean, you talk about that as altruistic surrogacy. It it stems from sacrificial love. It has nothing to do with money. This is sacrificial love. And, and, And again, Chuck and his wife are to be commended for being willing to sacrifice to that extent is a real testimony to their Christian character. But I want to go forward in saying that I think that the advice you got from the church is largely correct. I mean, I don't know what exactly they told you, but the premise of the advice is at least correct. Um, And I'll tell you why. The foundation of the one flesh marital relationship in Genesis is quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Remember where he quoted in Mark chapter 10, at the beginning of creation, God made the male and female, and for this reason a man will leave his mother and his father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they're no longer two but one flesh. And I think the premise here uh, is is validated by example. In other words, by anecdotes within the Scripture. Uh, For example, the potentially disastrous consequences of third-party involvement are demonstrated in the life of Abram and Sarai and Hagar. Not only that, but social science metrics show that surrogacy creates trauma for the baby separated from his or her birth mother and later uh, identifies problems for the children of their teens and adulthood. Uh, I, I should probably in this, uh, in this vein also mention that if in vitro fertilization is to be used at all, the sperm and the egg should come from the husband and the wife committed to raising the child, and no more eggs should be fertilized than the couple is willing to give a reasonable chance at full-term life. And that for a lot of reasons that I've written about in various uh, publications, including the complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition, available to the ministry of the Christian Research Institute. Uh, Also, a a great article in the Christian Research Journal comes to mind. It was titled, When Baby Making Takes Three, You, Me, and She. Uh, An important article you can find on the web at equip.org. Adoption is a good uh, option. Uh, There are over 100,000 foster children Uh, waiting to be adopted in the United States alone. So that's a good option. I mean, that situation is already there. It's a present need. And uh, so that would be a real good option to consider as well. Coming to the station break, we'll be back with a quote of the day and more of your questions right here on the Bible Answer Man broadcast. So please don't touch that dial. We live in what Oz Guinness calls an ABC moment, anything but Christianity, a moment in which Christianity is routinely ridiculed and Islam is referred to with reverential tones. Yet ABC can also serve to remind us that the solution for regaining Western civilization and defeating global Islamic jihadism is ultimately grounded in answers, biblical literacy, and countering cults. 
This is the task of the Christian church, the pillar and ground of truth. Find out more in Hank Hanegraaff's new book, Muslim, what you need to know about the world's fastest growing religion. To receive your copy as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. Hank Hanegraaff will be back right after this. Has God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs of the Bible's Divine Inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Equip. Org. So rapid and pandemic has been the decline of biblical literacy and spiritual discernment that our once unimaginable post-truth culture is effectively becoming an anti-truth culture. While the sun is setting on the Western church, Islam is now the fastest growing religion in the world. This means that it's not simply enough to be aware of this threat. Christians need to wake up, stand up, and speak up. This means being able to counter the outright lies about Islam that otherwise will go unchecked with horrendous consequences. And that's what Hank Hanegraaff's book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion, will enable you to do. To receive your copy as our appreciation for your financial partnership, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. Are you the product of millions of years of unguided, purposeless, natural processes? Or are you created in the image of a loving God? Faced with the overwhelming scorn of evolutionary proselytizers, it can be hard to articulate the truth about God's creative work. And even among faithful Christians, many misconceptions linger. The Creation Answer Book by Hank Hanegraaff puts answers to the most hotly debated origins questions right at your fingertips, giving you clarity and understanding. Learn to articulate the truth about our origins clearly and compassionately when you request your copy of the Creation Answer Book or listen to Hank's insightful answers with the unabridged audiobook version on CD. Receive your copy of the Creation Answer Book or the audiobook on CD from the Christian Research Institute when you call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Ideas have consequences, and in the case of Islam, the consequences historically have been unimaginably brutal. To believe that Islam is a religion of peace is a potentially fatal fiction. This is the time for naive and trusting Christians to take their heads out of the sand. True Islam has zero appreciation for the freedoms of Western democracies and would substitute the dehumanizing oppression of Sharia law in a heartbeat if given the chance. Read Hank Hanegraaff's stunning new book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. To receive your copy as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. Let's return to your host, Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you very much, Randy. The quote of the day comes from a chapter in a book titled, The Reformation 500 Years Later. 
And uh, the chapter itself is titled, Why Islam Was Important to the Reformation. And the author, Benjamin Weicker, who I've had on uh, the Bible Answer Man broadcast and uh, also had him on the Hank Unplugged podcast, a a, a very, very uh, wonderful Christian leader, great author, he points out that there are some pretty, pretty good reasons for examining Islam in a book about the Reformation. So this book is about the Reformation, and he talks about Islam in this chapter. The first reason he does that is that in our own time, Islam represents an enormous threat to Christianity, and it isn't just the threat of jihad. Uh, I've talked about this many times, but under a wave of Muslim immigration, Europe is being Islamicized at a unprecedented rate. Islam threatens now to replace both secularism and Christianity as the culture-defining, law-defining foundation of European civilization. And then Weicker points out that there's a second reason that is a bit of a surprise. It is the same fear that Christians feel today at the advance of Islam was felt even more keenly back then at the time of Martin Luther. The fear of Islam was part of the general apocalyptic dread that gripped all the Reformation's participants, and that includes Catholics and Protestants alike. For Luther, of course, Islam was seen as the scourge of an angry God aimed at an unrepentant Europe. And then Weicker gives a third reason, and that third reason is the quote of the day. It says Weicker, and I quote, the contemporary Islamic takeover of Europe is due in great part to the dominance of secularism, which simultaneously declares Christianity to be the worst of all religions and welcomes Muslims as the best of all neighbors, even though everything about Islam is diametrically opposed to secular liberalism. As a result, one barely hears a peep from the secular left at the massive extermination of Christians now, but much of the horror of the Christian crusades against the allegedly innocent Muslims way back then. Uh, Again, the quote of the day from Benjamin Weicker, and it comes from his book, The Reformation 500 Years Later, we'll post it on the web in short order. I wanted to do a little cleanup as well, and this is, uh, I think, very, very important because on Monday's Bible Answer Man broadcast, I received a question about the teachings of Ray Hagans, uh, the chief elder and pastor of the African village in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I mentioned Monday that he is a, a former Pentecostal ministry, and he promotes an idiosyncratic brand of black liberation theology, which he calls... African consciousness or spirituality. And among other controversial teachings, he denies that Jesus ever existed and contends that Christianity stems from ancient Egyptian religion. Now, I'm not going to go over all that I said about his teaching or the rebuttal of these nonsensical notions. I did that on Monday's show. But the reason I bring this up today is because among Hagen's many outrageous ideas is one that concerns the Council of Nicaea. This is the first Council of Nicaea, uh, 325 AD. And because the Council of Nicaea is is, is a, uh, well, it's a a favorite topic of critics of Christian orthodoxy. And, And that's why it warrants a further response. It's not just because he misinterprets it, or he reads something into it that is ahistorical, it is because many, many people do the same thing. I've done this show for about 30 years, and I've heard over and over again false history with respect to what happened at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., 
And the reason I'm noting A.D. 325 is because there was, uh, well, there were more than one Council of Nicaea. There were two. So um, I, I'm specifically quoting this because the 4th century council that everyone talks about and reads into uh, all kinds of things which never happened. So, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that the council invented the Trinity. Wrong. Uh, all one needs to do is go back to the seven ecumenical councils, in this case, the Council of Nicaea, and see that that is not the case. The Seventh-day Adventists, well, they sometimes say that the council initiated Sunday worship. Again, wrong. Uh, others contend that the council removed reincarnation from the Bible. So reincarnation was part and parcel of the Bible, and now it was expunged by the Council of Nicaea. Still others, they contend that the council was responsible for uh, repressing certain books used by early Christians and that the council created the canon of Scripture that we have today. And by the way, Hagen's own bizarre take on the Council of Nicaea is that the presbyter Arius was arguing that Jesus did not historically exist and that no one prior to the council had ever heard of Jesus. I mean, it doesn't get any more bizarre than that particularly in light of the fact that you can read uh, you can read the early Roman historians like Suetonius or uh, so many of the Josephus is another example I mean there are many examples and I give them in my book has God spoken but they all acknowledge that Jesus Christ existed so there's no one even in the secular world outside of fringe internet trolls who deny the trinity of Jesus Christ, I mean the deity of Jesus Christ, or the fact that he existed. Many people uh, deny the deity, obviously, but no one denies the fact that he actually existed. Well, all the suppositions that I just mentioned are, of course, 100% wrong. Sort of like the, uh, the prophets today, they're 100% wrong 100% of the time. Uh, so, if they're wrong, what was the Council of Nicaea up to in the 4th century? Well, the issue before the Council was this. It was the relationship between the Father and the Son. Did Jesus have the same nature as the Father, or did Jesus have a similar nature to the Father? Put another way, is Jesus a creature or is Jesus truly God? Well, this was a very poignant issue to take up. It wasn't what well, we're going to talk about today. No, this was a poignant issue because you had the presbyter Arius contending that Jesus was not eternal, but that Jesus was a creation of God. And the Nicene Creed reflects the council's judgment that the only begotten Son of God is light of light, true God of true God, of one essence with the Father. This is where you get Athanasius contra mundum, or Athanasius against the world. No matter what the world says, this is what I believe. Now, why is this what the council believed? Is it because a group of men come together and they decide to invent doctrine? No, because this is what Scripture says. If you look at John 1, Scripture is clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here we see that God not only was in essence before the world began, but he's differentiated from the Father and explicitly called God, indicating that he shares the same nature as the Father. And of course, Colossians 1, I've quoted many times on the broadcast, lets us know that all things were created by Jesus, that he is before all things, that in him all things hold together. And God was pleased, of course, to have all his fullness dwell in him. Only deity has the prerogative of creation, 
only deity pre-exists all things, and only deity personifies the full essence and nature of God. I think one final point ought to be made in this regard, and that is in Hebrews 1, and note I'm using John 1, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1 to make it easy for you to remember. It's the first chapter of John, Colossians, and Hebrews. But Hebrews 1 overtly tells us that according to God the Father himself, Jesus is God. How does uh, Paul put it in Hebrews? He says, about the Son, he the Father says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Note this, about the Son, he the Father says. There's another mistake that Muslims make. They think that when we're talking about the Son of God, that suggests sexual procreation. But in Trinitarian theology, it has to do with special relationship. And remember, we use words and language to communicate, but we have to explain what we mean by the words in the language that we're communicating with. So sometimes when we use the person word, we have to explain what we mean by person. Words are not univocal, they're equivocal. They take on the context or the meaning that the context allows them to have. But not only is this passage that I just quoted, but the entirety of Hebrews 1 is devoted to demonstrating the absolute deity of Jesus Christ. So again, at the Council of Nicaea, they weren't inventing something. They were codifying what the Scripture clearly communicated. That's what creeds do. That's what councils do. Yeah, and that's why we're thankful for the seven ecumenical councils. We're thankful for the Nicene Creed and uh, the Athanasian Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and others. They're not Scripture, but they carefully codify what Scripture says. We're out of time for this edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. During Monday through Friday this time, your questions answered live when you dial 888-ASK-HANK, numerically 888-275-4265. And my thanks to those who pray for me pray for this ministry and stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. What you're doing is making a difference, not only for time, but for eternity. Please be generous as you give. Please pray for this ministry. And remember, the audio book and the hard bound book available for those who support the ministry. So long for now. Thank you for joining us today. Our mission at the Christian Research Institute is to equip Christians to think and to live Christianly. Did you know that the Quran and the Hadith are full of commands to subjugate or kill unbelievers and that Sharia mandates proactive and perpetual war against Jews and Christians? In appreciation for your gift to help strengthen and expand the life-changing outreaches of CRI, Hank Hanegraaff would like to send you his new book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. Simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. You can also write CRI at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28271. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is funded solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because life and truth matter. Has God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken?, memorable proofs of the Bible's divine inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org, equip.org. The history of Islam is one of wanton carnage and horrific oppression. 
and it has been whitewashed beyond recognition by our politically correct elites. According to credible sources, 120 million Africans, 80 million Hindus, 60 million Christians, 10 million Buddhists have been slaughtered in the name of Islam. And that doesn't include the millions of Muslims killed by other Muslims. Islam is the only significant religious system in the history of the human race with a socio-political structure of laws that mandate violence against the infidel. Read Hank Hanegraaff's stunning book, Muslim, What You Need to Know About the World's Fastest Growing Religion. Receive your copy as our appreciation for your financial partnership when you call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org.